Hi, welcome to the interviews with the Haunting Masters brought to you by the OutdoorInsiders.com and the Sneak Tech Sneak Boot. This week, uh, we're talking to a buddy of mine, fellow podcaster, Zach Harold, and uh, Zach runs uh, Archery Maniacs podcast. Um, and, uh, you know, we're just going to kind of shoot the shit here a little bit, talk a little bit about podcasting, talk a little bit about prep, preparing for hunts and uh, whatever else comes up. What's going yeah. on, Zach? Oh man, I'm super excited to to be on the show with you and just talk about hunting season and everything like that. Talk a little bit about our podcast and where how they kind of evolved from something we were interested in doing and kind of did a little bit to something that we're now trying to actually pump into and make make something out of. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I just appreciate you having me on the show. Uh, for Absolutely. everyone that's listening, I'm Zach Harold with Archery Maniacs. Awesome, man. Thanks for being on. Yeah, we've talked about doing a little jo joint podcast for a long time. Yeah. Um, I remember when you had me as a guest on the show, like I was like number seven and you have like what, like a hundred and something episodes now? Yeah, the you were. You were literally uh, podcast seven and I just uploaded uh, podcast 155 today. Dude, you're just cranking them out. What are you doing, like three a week? I do four a week. Really? You release four podcasts a week? Yeah. We're going to run out of people to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And I think people would get rather sick of hearing me talk to myself. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm going to have to like come up with something different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nah, man. I think any more than two a week is just like I'm not. I'm only doing one a week. I was like, listen, I'm I'm gonna do this. I I told my sponsors, I'm like, I'm doing one a week. <laughs> Take it or leave it. I'll make fifty two of them a year. I might throw a bonus episode here and there, but that's it. Yeah. I'm like, because honestly, you don't want to get to the point where you're like, you're talking about the same stuff, just with different people. Because yep. a lot of it, I mean, of, I mean, everybody does something a little bit different and that's what you're looking for. You're looking for those little nuances, yep. especially if your podcast is, and I know a lot of it's like mine where you're, where you're trying to do, um, you know, educational type podcast, mm -hmm. you know, you're trying to learn tips and tactics, try to better the people who are listening, try to become better hunters and so on and so forth. If it was strictly entertainment and you're just doing, yeah, talking about stories. Yeah. You could do a millions of those. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm actually starting to kind of like incorporate a little bit more of those in and not make it all all 100% uh, informational. Um, I want to have some guys on and talking stories, telling you know, or guys that I've already had on for information and bring them back and tell stories and whatnot. Yeah, so, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. And actually, I kind of took a different approach. Um, I have one podcast that is generally somebody that's never been on the show ever. Mm -hmm. Um, and I use that whole entire podcast to get to know them, to get to know what things are working for them, the lifestyle they live, what they do, how they became who they became. Mm -hmm. And then I have, that's on a Monday. And then on Tuesday, I have stories from the red zone. And that's just a ton of fun. Cause it's just literally hunters. Like you're sitting around the campfire, BSing, telling hunting stories and then I'm fortunate because I've been able to hunt a lot. So I'm able to ask specific questions to really break their story down um, mm -hmm. to figure out why something worked or what worked or why it didn't. That way people can laugh and have fun, but also learn from a story environment. And then Wednesday, I have tips and tactics, which is literally no introduction, nothing. We have a topic, nuts and bolts, we get to it. And then Thursdays is a gear review, you know, so that that's a really, that's a simple one as well. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of like the stories. I'll never run out of people that want to share a story and probably never run out of gear that I can review. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, always I have. up with some other gadgets. <laughs> exactly. It's amazing how much stuff they come up with. <laughs> oh, cool, man. That's a neat approach. I don't think anybody else is doing that. That's good deal. So, that's the yeah. plan anyways. And we're about to incorporate actually target archery into it as well. My wife is really big into target archery. So we're going to start a weekly podcast called Journey to the Podium. That way we can send one out just for target archers because mm -hmm. for whatever reason, the archery community is divided as badly as we don't want it to be. It still is divided. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to do something like that, but I'm going to put a few of them together and we're going to work on doing once a week a, an actual true to the sense live episode as well. So we're, we're in the works of changing some things up. We got a store that's launching. I mean, it's just kind of crazy. We just got a lot of stuff in the works. We just launched a team of, I think we're going to have roughly a hundred new members on our archery maniacs team. Um, it's just crazy. Just things are growing. Congrats. Man. Congrats. 
Thank you. Congrats. Thank you. That's awesome. I appreciate it. No, it's great, man. So uh, what about you? I mean, I, when I first had you on, honestly, I, I – I didn't know that you had a podcast when I first reached out to you, and then you started telling me a little bit about it. And uh, since then, I've listened to some of your live stuff and then submitted questions and everything like that. So, you know, how do you know? Because you started podcasts when podcasting wasn't the thing, no. right? So, kind of, how did your podcast come about? And, and you know, where you know, what were your thoughts on that? Well, yeah. So it was about ten years ago. Um, there was a guy I used to listen to. He did blogging the outdoors. It was called, he had a little podcast and that's kind of what sparked my interest in it. I used to listen to him. Uh, it wasn't all hunting, but it was mostly hunting and fishing. And, um, I'm like, Oh, I should add this to the hunting channel online, which is a website that I own. It's a subscription based. So, you know, at the time I had like 10 or 15,000 subscribers to my website that used to come and watch videos, read articles, you know, uh, use the, the various functions of the website to plan, um, hunts and whatnot. And then, uh, so I added the interviews with the hunting masters where I would once a month, once a month, I would get a hold of, uh, somebody in the industry and we had to ask the pro section on the hunting channel for many, many years. And that, take those questions from there and I would ask them on a podcast to one guy. <laughs> and um so I only produced 12 a year and I did that for about six and a half, almost seven years. And then I stopped I quit doing them. And then about a year and a half ago, uh you know, I had been getting emails from people like, oh hey, we missed the interviews with the hunting masters on the hunting channel. Why don't you bring it back? Why don't you bring it back? And finally, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And then a buddy of mine is like, why don't you just do a podcast podcast and just, you know, put it out there for everybody. And I'm like, all right, you got me. <laughs> I'm like, so I didn't really want, I wasn't going to keep the name interviews with the hunting masters just because it sounds kind of, one, it's long and it's real. Mm -hmm. not, I, I didn't need to market it before because it was just on the hunting channel, but yeah. you know, putting it out there on the web, now it's something it's it's hard to market. It's hard to shorten up and make, you know, it's just a mouthful. There's number one. Number two, it sounds very uh, pretentious. Like, oh, this guy thinks he's a hunting master. But <laughs> when I did it, when I was doing it, I was truly back in the day, 10 years ago, there wasn't all these uh, Facebook professional hunters. Okay. So I lit like guys who wrote books, guys who were very well known, you know, so I... I viewed them as masters, not myself as a master, but them. I mean, there was an interview with the hunting masters, and that's why yeah. how it came out. But everybody's, you know, I'm like, ah, let me roll this out. I'm going to throw out a few of my old episodes first just to see what happens. And that's why I end up keeping <laughs> the name. I was going to originally call it the same as my TV show, Days in the Wild podcast. It would have been easier, easier marketing, smarter, but. Uh, I did what I did, and now I rolled it out as interviews with the hunting master still, and here we are a year and a half later. And, uh, and you're you know. doing one a week, right? I do one a week, yes. That's awesome, man. That's, that's still a lot of work. I mean oh, people yeah, understand, sure. you know, trying to collaborate with somebody else, and then you get it all in, and then you do whatever edits you need to do. Um, so yeah, so – that's still work, man. That's that's a lot of that's a lot of stuff you got going on there for sure. Yeah, and I still have the TV show too, so that eats up a crap load of time. <laughs> I mean, like crap time and money is like ugh, it's ridiculous. I sh I honestly wish I would have started doing the podcasting to the masses thing a lot earlier because I probably I, I've actually stepped back a little bit. I'm not I'm not going to be producing the TV show as a TV show anymore. I'm just going to put together, you know, a few films a year and that's it. I'm still going to try to film all my hunts and, and work for the best, but I'm, I'm not really doing a, a full fledged, you know, 12 season or 12 episode seasons anymore. Um, just cause it's just too much, man. And, and the way things are going and social media and the way that, sponsorship money is it's just it's so difficult now it just makes it's just ridiculous i mean i don't want to get into a whining campaign right now but 
<laughs> not what it used to be. Yeah. So fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Like that's definitely something that if you're not seeing the returns on the other end, then it's just simply not worth the hassle. No. No, not at all. So, uh, what uh, what hunts you got planned for this year? I have. I, my wife and I, I don't really know how, but we kind of drew everything that we applied for in Wyoming. Nice. You know, so super excited. Um, we drew uh, an elk tag that is an archery only elk tag, type nine in Wyoming. Um, what unit? Uh, <laughs> unit 55. It's all the way up there. 55 or 53. I don't know. One of those two. They're both right next to okay. each other, all Got the way it. up there next to the park border. So we get to go up there nice. and battle the, the wolves and the grizzlies. Nice. And, uh, but super excited. I think my cousin's going to come in and bring horses and just go have a good time. So in Wyoming, we applied as a party. So my wife and I got that tag. It was actually our third choice. Um, we drew buck antelope tags, additional dauphin antelope tags, two each, mm -hmm. a late season whitetail tag. Then we'll have a general deer tag. And then I will hunt Colorado elk, um, Idaho deer, Nebraska deer, and maybe Ohio deer, and Arizona deer as well, I think, in January. I know. You've been talking about coming down for a while. Oh, man. I've been really wanting to. It's just <laughs> – it's yeah. so cold here in January. <laughs> nah, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, Wyoming I know. Wyoming cold? <laughs> yeah, negative 20. <laughs> there was a few times at work that no kidding, it got to like negative 50, and I was like, why are we out here? <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty nuts. I can, my buddy Wade's always telling me stories, man, about how cold it gets. And he's like, he's like up by Buffalo. Yep. So, yeah. So it's. What about yourself? Uh, I drew a Wyoming bull tag as well. Oh, sweet. Um, yeah. So I'll be hunting the big horns. Awesome. Uh, awesome. It's a great hunt. And. Um, what unit did you draw? Uh, 36 or 35. I can't remember. But yeah. Sweet. And, I also I also pulled a, a region Y uh, deer tag as well, so I'll, I'll have uh, both tags in the pocket at the same time, hunt them at the same time. Um, my very next hunt, I just actually I just went blacktail hunting. I just got back um, like four or five days ago, and then um, yeah, in California, and that was that was fun hunt. I um, my next hunt is Utah. I have a bull elk hunt in the Central Manti, which is um, it's a good unit. It's not the best unit, but it's a good unit. It's got a lot of good bulls in it, a lot of elk, period. Um, and then uh, let's see. I have uh, – I'll be going – I have like three white whitetail hunts on the agenda this year too. I'll go to South Dakota, um, New York, and uh, Missouri. So October, November for those. Um, I plan on – oh, I drew an awesome tag here in, in Arizona for rifle muley. Oh, uh, sweet. Yeah, a rut hunt, So, which I've never got a rut hunt muley tag. I should have never put in for one either, so <laughs> I decided this because I always chase them with the bow. Honestly, I never really – I'm like, you know, I, I try to put in for harder hunts, and I was like, uh, you know, like strip tags and stuff, and then I was like, yeah, you know what? Let me put in for this. This is a really good unit that I used to hunt archery all the time. They closed it for archery last year. Uh, and this year, so I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna put in there because I can't hunt it with the bow this year. Let me try to put and get it with the rifle. I'm like, I think they gave like 20 tags or something like that. I'm one of the one of the few people that got it. So, heck yeah, yeah, that's wicked cool. That'll be a lot of fun. I mean, I, I hunted deer in the rut last year for the or mule deer for the first time ever. Um, I went with uh, Brian Barney and we hunted Montana, and I just had the video camera nice. and. I've never, never got to do anything with deer, mule deer in the rut, and that's freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah, you, you guys, are, you guys don't really get to hunt them in the rut. <laughs> well, that's no, not true. I, that's not entirely true. The, if you get that, you can go in that tail, tail end of the last few days of the uh, rifle season. Yeah, you there's some, a you got rutting, and then you have rutting whitetails too. You can hunt. Yep, yep. Yeah, we can hunt whitetails all the way to the end of November. But as far as mule deer, I think in Wyoming, the latest season, unless it's a special draw, because I don't, I don't ever apply for mule deer special draws. I don't right. find a point, you know. Um, but the latest, I think, somewhere around November 10th or something. Yeah. Um, yep. Which, depending on the year, they could be kicked into the rut by then. 
Yeah. I, I remember going there one time. I always go in early season, I usually go in September and haunt a archery, but um, I went back for three days and shot one uh, during the rifle season and um, they were, they were, they were nosing and nose around and, you know, acting a little ruddy, nothing, mm-hmm. nothing crazy, but so. So which hunt are you most looking forward to this year? Jeez, man. I don't know. I mean, I got two, two premier elk tags. I'm, I'm excited about both of them. Yeah. I'd like to, I don't think I've ever killed two bull elk in one year. That'd be awesome if I can do that. Yeah. I've never had two sure. kind of... eggs in one year either. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I've never drew people like that. I I shouldn't say I've had, I've had two. I've I killed. Um, actually, I did kill two bull elk. Yeah, now that I think about it, I had one over the counter tag. Um, okay, yeah, back in like seven years ago or something like that. But yeah, I just um, I've never I've never drawn two premier tags, in you know. In the same year so this should be interesting. yeah yeah for sure that's kind of i'm i'm really excited about my colorado hunt i don't know about more than other units but last year was the first time i have ever hunted colorado for elk uh, it's uh-huh. just that over the counter tag you know there and so i'm super excited about hunting that simply because as you know anytime you can go to an area more than once your mm-hmm. odds start to grow so yeah. I'm, I'm excited about that hunt for sure <laughs> Yeah, you start but, figuring figuring things out, and that's usually what happens to me. Like, that's why I always end up killing like last day because it, by the time I'm figuring them out, it's like about the time I'm getting ready to leave. So, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah that's uh, that's cool, man. Yeah. So, what? Go ahead. No, you go. I'm just gonna say, you know, what's what are a few of the things that you're really focusing on this year as far as preseason? Um, that you feel last year were kind of a weakness that you've really been focusing on this year to kind of fix? Well, I didn't – last year I for sure did not get time uh, to practice shooting. I didn't shoot a lot last year, um, and I really saw it. I, I had an I drew Ibex again. It was my second time, so last year, and I really felt like <sighs> – had I practiced a little bit more with that bow, I actually missed three times. Uh, there were very steep shots. It was super windy. But all in all, I felt like had I practiced a little bit more, I may have made that shot. Like I just wasn't super comfortable with that bow yet. Um, and that was partly Matthew's fault. I'm going to blame it on them. They took their sweet. <laughs> they took their sweet time sending me the bow. So half my season, I was hunting with my old bow, and then I kind of, I kind of switched gears like a little late in the game. Gotcha. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so, like that's my scapegoat right there. That's my reason. <laughs> somebody else. Not my fault. Uh, that and really physical fitness, man. Because I've got a shit last see 2015 man when i went on that ibex hunt i was in awesome shape 16 not at all i mean not i shouldn't say not at all but not nearly where i was and this year i'm kind of feeling the same way i'm like just way behind i i was kind of sucking wind bad in california and i wasn't even at elevation (laughs) you know i bet you're hunting at a thousand feet over there in cali it's like yeah but um yeah so my next hunt's at like 9,500 to like 11,000 feet or something like that. And I'm going to be like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a little bit of elevation change from California. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to have like lead weights attached to my legs and feel like I'm <laughs> sucking wind through a straw. And that's, not, that's coming up quick, man. It's not like I got a bunch of time too. I got about three and a half weeks to get ready for that. So It's and, crazy. Uh, I can't believe that today's the last day of july i'm i'm not sure where it went it's just nuts to me yeah i'm happy though i can't i I can't stand the summertime freaking hate it i hate it because well for one my other business is a pool company so like every time summertime rolls around my life gets exponentially more busy my stress level goes up (laughs) and 
I live in Arizona, so the heat sucks. You know, you go from air conditioning to air conditioning. It's not like you can do anything outside. And if you do, it's like, ugh. but yeah, I, I hate summertime. I really do. Um, I'm the same way. It's my least favorite time of year. <laughs> yeah. Well, most hunters don't like summertime unless they're, you know, you live in a place where it's fun to go scouting and, you know, the air, the weather's cool and whatnot. Um, but yeah, here sucks. So. Yeah. 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 I, <clears throat> with, with scouting, you know, what's kind of your, what's your thoughts on elk scouting? You know, me personally, I think <clears throat> the elk are kind of where the elk are. And you could go and you could scout and you could see them there and you go back and they'd be nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm almost to the point where I'm just like, I think I'm going to save the time that I do have as far as scouting goes for, you know, mule deer and, and whatever else. Cause it's like, I have a few spots where I'm going to find elk and they're either going to be in this one spot and they're not. And if they're not, they're going to probably be in the next spot. And if they're not there, they're going to be in the third spot. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, this is my take on elk. It all depends. Obviously it all depends on the time of year that you're hunting them. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're hunting them during the rut, I focus on where all the cow groups are, you yep. know, look for all the cow groups, look for those areas that, have a good feed and good water because I mean elk are a big animal so they need a lot of water and they need a lot of feed. My stupid dogs, I don't know if you can hear them in the background. I'm <laughs> shut up for the last five minutes. <laughs> Apologize. I never do podcast I never do podcasts at home when when my family's here because they're like maniacs. They're always my kids are always yelling at each other. My dogs never <laughs> shut up. <laughs> so I apologize for everybody out in the podcast world if you hear my uh Hear my maniacs in the back, <laughs> and they're not archery maniacs. Um, <laughs> Dang it! <laughs> the uh, yeah, so elk. <laughs> I can send them a shirt. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so elk, I uh, I really, I really, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna hunt the rut, I focus on cows. I don't even look for bulls. You know, they're not gonna help me. Um, yeah. some of the things I do look for though, is I look for like old rubs. Okay. Um, makes sense because if there rubs, there's rubs in there, that's me. That means that's where they were last year during the rut. <laughs> Nine times out of 10, they're going to be back in that same area. Um, you know, and if, on the late season hunts, I'm just looking for the stuff that they need for that time of year, you know? Yeah. So it, it's it's always trying to match the needs of the animal, um, you know, to the to that time of year. It's 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 not rocket science, but it's more less up to your observation skills and your attention to detail, really, you know. But the, the actual science behind it's not very difficult. It's you know, elk need this this that this time of year. You know, during the rut, they need to get some punana, so. That's yeah. uh, that's what they're interested in, <laughs> but <laughs> that the is cows, so true. <laughs> but the cows have calves with them usually, and they need food and they need water. So you look for those areas that hold cows, and the bulls will show up eventually. Yep. So yeah, same thing with deer, hunting deer in yeah. the rut. I do the same thing, like mule deer. Like if I go out scouting right now in the spots that I hunt mule deer during the rut, I will not see a single buck out there. I'll. I mean, once in a while, you'll catch one coming to a water hole on a kit trail camera or something, but I won't see him. I won't see him the way I, I see him. He's come rut time, psh, they're pop, popping up all over the place where all these does that I've seen through the year are at. So, mm -hmm. yeah. What about you? What are you, uh, what are some of the things that you're doing to prepare? You know, I, shooting definitely. Um, last year I missed. Not not the biggest bull I've ever shot at, but one of the biggest. I mean, and I got it all on film. <laughs> awesome. That's always a great reminder. <laughs> right, right. And and I hit full draw, and I watched my pin. He was like 35 yards. Oh, I watched geez. my pin float over him, and when it hit there, I flinched. And when I flinched, I started to cam over, and I caught it about right here. Uh -huh. I started drawing back again, and I got to about here, and I hit the trigger. <laughs> You know, so I wasn't anchored or nothing. I just did just, yeah, right. 
just all me, you know, definitely nothing I can blame it on. It's all me, but I just, yeah. I have a, I'm shooting a different release this year and I just started shooting it like a week and a half ago. So I'm really trying uh, to, yeah, I'm really trying to get, <laughs> don't change that close to season, bro. Right. Right. Um, you shoot, you shoot I, I, just by your action. I'm you're shooting a thumb. This, this new one's a thumb release. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I was, I just was getting where I was punching the trigger really, really bad with my index style. Yeah. And, and I feel really comfortable with this thumb release and I, I'm not going to say that I'm shooting better, but my, my groups are just as tight already. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, getting, getting more relaxed with it and everything like that. Absolutely. And then obviously fitness, I've really been trying to dial in nutrition to, um, I'm, I'm on an all keto diet. I actually literally right before this podcast, I had Zach Griffith on my podcast and oh, he yeah. and I were, he and I were talking about the keto diet and the importance, you know, not really the importance, but I guess the power of switching your body from carb fuel to fat fuel. Right. And, right. and so I went through and I've been, my, my wife's on it as well. So we've been doing a lot of research and, and making our own meals that, are zero carbs but really really high in fat contents so that uh that's what we can take to the woods and to the back country instead uh right. which we're which i'm really looking forward to um it's just been helping me a bunch i just feel better on it um so i'm excited about that so making all those meals um i've been doing that as well <clears throat> and then just dialing everything else in, you know, getting, I got a new sleeping pad because my other one just sucked and I wasn't getting sleep like I needed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I got a new stove. Um, I went from a jet boil to a BRS and my BRS stove is 0. 0.9 ounces. I mean, it's literally this big, Nice. you know, and so just been, just been switching stuff. I got a Steri pin this year too which I'm excited about using. Mm -hmm. um, so just, just did more research this year and switching some things up and got things lighter than I, cause before I kind of like, I don't really care if it's, if it's, uh, if it's heavier, right. you know what I mean? Like, like my pack, I don't really care if my pack weighs 11 pounds as opposed to six pounds dry right. pack. But this year I was like, that's kind of a lot for a pack. Yeah, it is. You know, and I so I started taking stuff off and doing this, that, and whatever. And now my pack's like five and a half pounds. So right there, I just saved myself like five ish pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm just like that, and trying out different style of boots and everything like that, and just all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Success is in the details, man. Oh yeah, and boots are just something that's they're so important. But it's so hard to be able to like me call up you and say, "Hey, John, what what boot do you use?" It, it's all feel, man. Oh feel. yeah, it, well, and people's foot structures are so different. I mean, some people, like Brian Barney, is a great example. That guy hunts and carries out all kinds of weight. He hunts sometimes fifteen, twenty miles in, mm. and and he's doing it all in like running shoes. Yeah, I got a, I got a couple friends here that hunt and run issues. I'm like, yeah, freaking nuts. Yeah, and it's just it's just Nike so freeze. different. It's so <laughs> different because I'm just like, man, when you got like when you have a hundred plus pounds in your pack, running shoes aren't supposed to work. <laughs> like, yeah. but I mean, it's working for them, and they don't their feet don't get they don't hurt. They their ankles well, don't my hurt. My feet you know, hurt so just right now listening to you. <laughs> I'm serious. I got the worst freaking feet ever. I got like bad plantar fasciitis. I've had surgeries. I've had all kinds of crazy shit with my feet. But uh, yeah, so I have, I have to wear super rigid, you know, rigid boot with a – which is weird because the bottom has to be super rigid. But because I have such a high instep, my – the top has to be nice and supple so it moves and i can't use anything that's over three quarters i can't go like a you know a shin height boot or something like that or snake boot forget about it. i could never wear that yeah um you know so it's like yeah i i for me i've been wearing the mammoth uh gtx matter of fact i got my i got my girls yesterday to wax them up for me <laughs> put them to work those are the ones i use right there you know, just yeah. You know, um, so the the shanks real real tough, and uh, they got good heel brakes. 
and uh, it's it, and the top is supple and it's nice, so it's kind of it meets my needs. It's and it's not super expensive either. I think they're like two hundred and thirty dollar boots, two hundred forty dollar boots. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, I've tried like really expensive boots. I've had Kenna tracks. I've had you know, um, you know, Scarpa and Zamberlin, and I just I go with these because they work for me, man. Yeah, and that's that's how I, that's how affordable find boots are. You know, it, the, you got to find a pair that works for you. You can talk to everyone out there, but unless you're doing something like uh, what's that company, Lathrop and Sons, where they oh, custom yeah. make you shoot, like that's a little different because those, those guys, guys know awesome. what they're doing. They map your feet. You know what I mean? But if I call you up and you're like, "Yeah, I use this boot. This is why that boot might not fit my foot whatsoever." You know, and oh, it's yeah. just it's just crazy. Yeah. Another thing that I have struggled with with boots is is uh, getting them to hold up. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had that issue. And then uh, one thing that I was listening to another podcast, I remember Hunt the Backcountry, and, and Brian was on there with those guys talking about boot weight. Mm-hmm. I never really thought about it, but they're like, if you have a heavier boot and you take 20,000 steps that day, that's – you just literally lift, did – four pounds times 20, you know, 20,000 times, like, holy crap, you know, I never thought of it that way until they brought it up. (laughs) Yeah. People think about that stuff for sure. I, I prefer something that's not terribly heavy also, you know, yeah. there's, there's companies out there that are using, you know, carbon fibers and stuff like that in their shank instead of, you know, heavier plastics or heavier or metal. Some of those metal shank boots are freaking lead weights man you might as well tie some anchors but um yeah no i'm, I'm i i agree with that that's something it's and it's it's hard because you want to find some, comfort's the biggest thing you know if you got to find something that's comfortable for you and that doesn't hurt your feet but if you can find something that's comfortable and doesn't hurt your feet and is lighter weight then and a hold you up a winner. Yeah. <clears throat> you know it, me the hold up thing is Hey, if they last me a season, great. Unless I'm paying yeah. thousands of dollars for them, you know. But if you know, I'm not saying that it, money's no option for me. But if I had to spend two hundred fifty dollars every season to get myself into a pair of boots, three hundred dollars max, you know, I would do it. But yep. I wouldn't be buying myself a pair of thousand dollar boots every season if they were going. I don't <laughs> care. I don't care how freaking light and comfy they were. <laughs> but, you know. So, no, that no these have been good to sense. me. These have been good to me. They've that's awesome. I, I get. I usually get about. I don't know. I figured it out in miles last year. I think I put about like two hundred plus miles on that set of boots. Uh huh. And Heck yeah, they're ready to go this season. I think yeah, they're good. The tread held up really good. So, yeah, that's awesome. But uh, no, other than that, man, I just want to get my, I just want to get my fitness up. I, I can't get my diet straight. Um, I eat a lot of everything, good, bad, ugly, you know. <laughs> I just, uh, I'm a foodie, man. So it's like, I mean, the other night, what was it, last night? No, it was the night before. I, I took my son out and went, met my, with my parents and uh, I must have ate like six slices of pizza. We went to Grimaldi's and I was like, yeah. <laughs> I'll have a slice of pizza and some salad. Yeah, I had salad and six, five, five or six <laughs> slices of pizza. <laughs> like, that's just me, man. I can't. I got no. I got no uh, shut off switch when it comes to food that I like. Yeah, it's it was kind of interesting because I've been like I told you I've been doing this keto diet, and then I was like, oh, pizza sounds really good, and I yeah. ate so much pizza, I likely to throw up. Yeah, because your body's not used to burning carbs anymore, so it doesn't really know what to do with them. And I ate like half, like three quarters of a large pizza, and before I knew it, I was like, eh, I don't know, <laughs> something good might not come out of this." <laughs> right? Did you get Did you get dizzy and stuff? Because I've heard. Oh yeah, I, it just was like I felt just giant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you gotta be, you gotta be careful on the keto diet too. So not a lot of people know this, but my first degree in college was exercise physiology. Um, and, um, keto diets, that's, that's nothing new. It's been around forever. That, that style of diet. It's, I mean, um, you just got to watch out because keto diet means ketoacidosis. You don't want to put your 
kidneys kidneys in trouble there and uh, mm-hmm. kidneys in your liver so you just got to be careful on those things just don't go too crazy and kind of have a little balance and make sure you're getting enough veggies here and there to kind yeah of, i mean a, optimal performance wise you go balls to the wall like zach does and you'll, you're going to trim up you're going to look great you're going to feel great but long term got to be careful with that stuff yeah so for cautionary sure. tale i've had i had a friend who uh i mean they can't say 100 percent, but uh i think that's why he passed away so just got to kind of watch out for that yeah well what else is uh what else is new in the uh archery maniacs world you know we are like i told you the team is pretty new um so when we, you say team you got what is it by basically pro staffers underneath working yeah there? yeah pretty much so we have a field team a pro team and an elite team mm-hmm. and uh we are uh receiving all the, the signed contracts back at this moment and uh it's it's an interesting <laughs> it's an interesting endeavor yeah <laughs> you know uh but I think all in all, it's going to be good, you know, because now, now as opposed to myself, um, obviously I'm, I'm helping these people out and, and doing what I can for them and giving discounts and that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. for all kinds of companies. But, you know, the nice thing is now it's no longer just myself spreading the word on the podcast. It's a hundred other people. And that's huge, you know, and that's, that's a huge plus. I mean, and we're growing. I mean, we, we're, uh, like, I don't know, 12,000 12, downloads a month or more. That's um, awesome, so, man. You know, we're getting there, but um, August 1st, I believe, is my, my – or 4th, August 4th. One of those two dates is my, my one-year anniversary of the of the podcast. So Yeah. That's <laughs> huge, man. It's, it's been interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but – you know, we're, we're getting somewhere and, uh, and I, I would like to turn this into an actual, you know, career. So right. that, that, that's why I'm, you know, people are like, man, you're nuts. You're putting in way too much time. I'm like, well, you don't understand what my end goal is here. Yeah. You yeah. know, I don't, I don't like the job that I currently do, you know, so it's definitely don't want to do that forever. This is what I would like to do something more along these lines. So mm-hmm. that, that's why I'm willing to get up at 4 a.m. and do podcasts until I go to work and then get off work and do more podcasts until 10 or 11 and go to bed and start all over. (laughs) Yeah. Crazy, man. Yeah. No, that's good. I I applaud your ambition for sure. Um, And the fact that you're at 12,000, that's huge, you know, being as, you know, fledgling of a podcast as you are. And, and don't hope this doesn't sound like a backhanded compliment, uh, you know, backhanded compliment, but I do really think that, you not already having a name for yourself beforehand, um, that's even more impressive that you've gotten to that level. Because I mean, you came out of nowhere. You know, for me it was a little bit easier. At least I had something to, you know, I had something behind me already. Um, so yeah. Well, that means a lot. It really does. It's, and that's kind of what it's all. It's been people like. I'll have them on the podcast, and one of the first things they tell me is, "Hey, man, I'm a nobody. I'm not yeah. sure why you want me on the podcast." And it's like, "Have you ever heard of me?" Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, "No." And I was like, "Well, there we have it. <laughs> We're gonna have a good podcast." <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, don't know. yeah. No, I know. I, you know what? That's great because it, it's um, it can't be too elitist because then people can't relate. Yeah. You know? For sure. Yeah. Like I, I try, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd love to have some really, really big name guys on the podcast too. Like I, I've been trying like hell to have freaking Cam Haynes uh, come on, but keeps dodging my bullets, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> I, it, could, and the reason why is because my fans keep asking for him. So yeah. I'm like, oh, let me try to get him on, you know, I yeah, talked no, to him a couple of times about it and they say yes. And then they don't show, you know, they don't, uh, they don't come through. Uh, I had a couple other guys too that I'm not going to, you know, name out that did the same thing. And I'm like, okay, man. I mean, it's your fans that are asking for you. I just, I'm just trying to facilitate it. But you know, if you don't want to be on it, you don't want to be, I'm not going to force you. But at the same time, I'd much rather have, um, 
you know, I don't want to use the word average Joe, but I'd rather have the guy that people can relate to that they can they can see themselves becoming very easy or already at that level and, you know, of Hunter and just like to see what the other guy does, you know? Yeah. So it can't, can't all be Jim Shockey's and, uh, right? you know. Whatever. And actually it's funny that you bring that up because I put out a podcast questionnaire and I was doing a giveaway for, mm-hmm. for people to answer it. Right. And, that's some of the things that the people said. They're like, we love that you don't have big names on your podcast because I can relate to those people. And I was like, that's why I do it. (laughs) You know, I have some of my buddies that like my one buddy Flint, that dude is just a natural born killer. I mean, he kills 340 in -hmm. the last six years. He's killed a bull elk five out of the six years. And I mean, he, he shoots, white tail every year, mule deer every year. And I mean, the dude is just a natural born killer. And I lo- he doesn't even have an Instagram, just barely got Facebook. You mm-hmm. know, nobody knows him because he hunts because he loves it. Right. right. And I love having people like that on the show because especially when they know, like, and trust you, they're willing to share and help and do anything with everyone, but they just don't have all that other crap and aren't well known because that's not why they do it. Right. You know? mm-hmm. No. Yeah. I get it. I get it. But yeah, I get the I just, flip side too. Like I had a, I had a, a guy on a friend of mine uh, and I got some, I got some like negative feedback. They're like, Oh, why would you have a guy like that on? You know? And I'm like, you know, he's just a kid, da, 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 blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, because I think he had something to offer and I, you know, I think he brings something to the table. And I think people can relate to him, you know? So you're not going to, you're not going to, please everybody but just do what you do man you're obviously doing the right thing you got 12,000 downloads a month that's a lot more than some of these guys have been doing for a couple years now um you know i I just reached 30 something just recently and like i said i had i had something i had a lot bigger boost to start off with i had already had a following a large following that i just you know regurgitated my my uh my new stuff onto so you know yeah just but uh no that's awesome you know one thing that would probably be pretty cool to cover is is kind of what your the logistics of you planning your season looks like you know because one of the i think it's almost like a a mental block that mm-hmm. people are like you know what i really want to hunt multiple states but what if i draw all the tags at once or which area do I really need to apply for? Or gosh, there's just so much work in this, that, and whatever to do. And I'm under the belief that if you step over that whatever threshold or whatever you got going on and you hunt one state out of state, it can mm-hmm. even be over the counter. It doesn't matter. You do the research for that unit, you go, you hunt. I think it just like makes you all of a sudden, wow, this isn't as hard as it thought it was. I thought it was, right. you know what I mean? Well, uh, I myself, I start off every year. I have a, um, like an Excel spreadsheet. And so let's, let's put it this way. When I was doing the show, Uh I knew I had to do just based on my personal, um, success rate. Um, I knew I have, I have an 80, 80 to 85% success rate on my hunts for the last 10 years. Uh Uh-huh. So, um, I knew that it always, I had a plan about 14 hunts a year to make 12 shows. Okay. So, and I always look at it like this. I I look at the months, look at the start of the season, the end of the season. And if we're just talking about fall and winter, which is what most guys do, and we're not talking about spring hunts because I never, I never did spring hunts for my show. Well, I shouldn't say never, but I rarely, rarely did spring hunts. Um, so for instance, July, there's nothing going on. I knew mm-hmm. I could go to California, go to the California, you know. So I just, that's not a draw hunt. It's a first come first serve tag, uh, meaning they have X amount of tags in that in a unit or in the region. Uh, or they call them zones there. And once they sell out of them, which they never do, there's no more tags. So it's basically a guaranteed over the counter tag. Gotcha. Um, so I just go through and I put in, 
I put in for all my all my uh, tags and the ones that I ha have a real likelihood, I start, you know, plugging those in saying, oh, I should draw this, I should draw this, I should draw this. But if I don't, you know, so for me, I basically try to, let me back up here. I try to schedule no more than two hunts in a month. Okay. Uh, I do that for my wife's sanity. <laughs> I do that for my, my business. <laughs> Um, you know, and if I am doing two in a month, I try to keep those hunts six days or less. I actually okay. very rarely go more than seven days on a hunt anyway, period. My, gotcha. my, my season is always one week at a time. It's basically just one week. And that's what I got. I got a, I got a scout. I got a hunt, kill, get it on film all in a week. And that's it. That's what I got to do. So it's not like, you know, when you're hunting in your home state, you can go, you could go scouting, say the season's three weeks long. Oh, you know, I'll go for five days here. I'll go another three days there. So when you're traveling, you can't do that. Everything's boom. It's from here to here. You know, you got to make sure that you get it all done. And that's, that's where the logistics comes into play. Um, that's why I stopped camping when I go out of state. I don't very, very rarely do backcountry hunts because of that. I go to, you know, I stay, usually operate out of a little cheap ass motel and I drive, and I just put more more boots uh, miles on the boots, you know. Just hike in longer, you know. Just wake up earlier, sleep a little less. But um, anyway, I'm 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 getting off on a tangent. No, that, I look at that, it. You're getting there though. Like that's that's all all stuff that people wouldn't think of doing. You know what I mean? So I mean, I'll, I'll for instance, okay. So right now, uh, the last couple of days, I've been planning my hunt for South Dakota. Um. You know, there's airfare, there's a rental truck, motel, food and whatnot. If you can drive there, great, drive. It saves you the money on the airfare, saves you the money on a rental truck. And then it gives you the option to bring camping gear and you can camp. But nine times out of 10, for me, if it's over five, sometimes I'll push six hours. If it's over six hours drive, I don't drive. Because you're losing one day on either end that you're not going to get the hunt. Mm -hmm. Where if you fly, you usually get that as a half day. You fly gotcha. in early in the morning, get there, you hunt that afternoon. When you fly out, <clears throat> you make it a you make it a late flight in the after and you know in the evening or late afternoon. That way you hunt the morning. Yep. And, and to me, that extra time makes a big difference in the field. It's, I mean, because listen, it's a numbers game. The more time you spend, the more stalks you get, the more glass, you you know, better chance you are getting, a, getting an animal. And when you only have a week to work with, you got to optimize that week. Mm -hmm. So. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And that's funny because uh, you like, like you say, your 80% success rate kind of speaks for that working for you. Cause that's very unconventional advice, you know, in all honesty, cause you, Anytime you hear of somebody talking about going mule deer hunting or whatever else, they're like, yep, threw it all in my backpack and way we went, you know, I was yeah. up there for five days and it's just, but if, but if you're doing the same thing where rather than walking in five miles camping and then hunting three to five miles out of camp, mm -hmm. you know, rather than doing that. If you're covering 10 miles a day, you're covering the same country, but you're just doing it in a whole different way. Yeah. Um, it's a little more fast and furious, so to speak. I mean, like I'm, I, I try to be mobile. I learned from a, a real famous hunter out here in Arizona, you know, 12 plus years ago. Um, <sighs> and he said to me, John, he goes, this is Dwayne Adams. He's like, John, if the deer aren't there, they're not there. So, <laughs> and he, and I saw that he would just pick up and move, pick up and move, pick up and move. And, you know, where other guys that I hunted with before, they would just sit in that one basin and look, you know, look at the mountain, just beat it up the whole damn day <laughs> until something came up. And that, that works too. Don't get me wrong. That, that works too. But I think you give yourself more opportunity if you, you know, you go after it. Um, and that's, and that's kind of what I took from it. So I, you know, and just the years of having a filming and having a camera guy in tow for, 
you know, now going on 13 years or 14 years, it's like you just start adapting. You just start adapting and and having to travel. Like I used to go, like when I when my kids were really young. I have a you know a year and a half year old son, but my daughters are are eight and six. You know, when they were super young, I um I would go on three day hunts, four day hunts, just so I wouldn't be away from the family. I mean, talk about pressure to get things done. Um, yeah. And consequently, that's why I have a lot of medium sized animals on my wall and, and small, and I've killed a lot of small deer and stuff in my life because I never wanted to go home empty handed. Um, I, I got a thing with that. I just, I don't, I hate burning tags. Um, so I, you know, opportunity presented itself. I took it. But, um, you know, you start learning. I don't want to say shortcuts. You start learning what you need to do to kind of, be efficient. That's the word I'm looking for. Being efficient as possible. And I found for me that going on a backcountry hunt or, you know, packing in real far was never really efficient way of hunting. When I knew that I can hunt the front country, yeah, your competition is way bigger. You have so much more, more people to deal with. You got all the weekend warriors and you know, the game not, is not necessarily as, uh, the game density is not as, as, as high, uh, your chances at getting a really big giant, is, but you start finding ways to work around it. And honestly, like, I feel like it's made me a way better hunter because I've always had to deal with competition. I've always had to deal with that, you know, freaking six guys sitting on the same ridge as me looking you know, but yet I'm still the one going on with a deer and they're not. Mm -hmm. It's just, you kind of, you just kind of learn to be efficient and learn like the, the shortcuts of how to, how to get, how to get it done because you're always underneath the gun. You know, I know yeah, that kind of got a little bit away from how I plan my hunts, but you know, that's kind of, but that all goes into planning your hunt, you know, cause I'm the same way. Like there's nothing worse than burning your money on a tag and then going coming home empty handed, right. you know, that's, that's a crappy, especially when you go there and you work your ass off, you know, <laughs> then it's way worse. Yep. It's like, yeah. it just sucks. So I, uh, you know, it all, it all ties into it. I, I see your face cringing with your dog. Oh my God. I want to jump through the door right now and strangle the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> hey, shut up. <laughs> and that is our break for the moment. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> like her commercial break. <laughs> Just no, I, I, yeah, that is exactly why it is. they're they're maniacs. The dogs are freaking off the hook. They bark at everything. I, I, you know what? It's funny because I got a big dog and a little dog. Oh, now here comes my son. Ah, dad. Here. You know what I mean, Zach? Say hi, Zach. <laughs> hi, buddy. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's not. It's nonstop here at the Stallone residence. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, just live it up, man. It's. Mine's already five, and I don't even know when he when he got five. It's just uh, oh, I don't crazy. know. I don't even know how it happened. I just like I tell him, buddy. He's like, Dad, next year I'm gonna be six, and I'm just, buddy, you need to just slow down yeah, and be five for a whole away. year. He's like, nope, I'm turning six. And I'm just like, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, my girls do that. Excuse me. They're always my my middle. My youngest daughter, my middle child, Olivia, she's she's already talking about her birthday, and it was just in May. She's like, "Oh, my birthday next year." <laughs> yeah, like, you're like, "That's a whole." We did that too. Come on, we used to. I remember growing up. I would, I would, I would think, uh, you know, in terms of half. Oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm seven and a half. I'm not seven, seven and a half. You know. Yeah, whatever. seven and three so quarters. <laughs> now I'm like, God, I don't even want to think about the next birthday. <laughs> You're still a young dude. How old are you? I'm 26. Oh, Jesus Christ. I wish I was 26 again. 
I was a freaking animal at 26. I'm like, a shell. I'm like a shell of myself compared to what I was at 26. Uh, again, I'm going to be 42. So, Yeah. It's crazy was, how quick it goes. Yeah. If I knew then what I know now. <laughs> That's even, even me, you know, I think, I think you think that about any age you are. Once you, once you understand what that means, I think you think mm. that any age you are. <laughs> yep. That's true. Well, anyway, so I guess, uh, you know, it's just planning out a state hunt. You just got to do it. You just got to pick a week. You got to go, you got to research it and go to do it. Once you do a couple, uh, the rest start getting easier and just, you know, limit yourself. There's really in the United States, you can literally go hunting every month in the, in the, in the calendar year. You know, whether it's turkey or bear or whatever in the spring, uh, you could go to Hawaii and go hunt axes deer. You could go to Texas and pretty much hunt every 365 days a year if you wanted to, um, you know, on exotics and whatnot. But there's something going on to hunt all year round. So if you if you think about it like this, and I don't, I mean, this is my extreme life. You know, I'm like, if you do one a month, you know, for from july to february which is what i do basically um even though i do more than one a month but you do one a month you really you know you're taking one week and you're 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 gone for whatever that is seven weeks or six weeks out of a year and you know if you can afford to do that with your with your job and with your family then awesome you know you you can do you can be an adventure hunter and it, for me, I think there's like nothing cooler than that. It's like, I love seeing new places. I love doing new things. Um, you know, that's what I, that's why I do this for more than anything. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like getting my hands bloody. Um, I got a little bit of bloodthirst in me, but uh, it's, more, <laughs> you know, hey, listen, any hunter that tells you they're not is they're fucking lying to you. Excuse my French, but they're full of shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you do it because it's a rush. You do it because, you know, whatever. Yeah. it's, it's, it's part of you but um in all honesty like the biggest drive for me is the experience and that's why i tell people i said you know well i had an article out and i did a podcast many years ago or not many many years ago but a few years back on, on uh trophy hunting and meat hunting and I'm, i tell people i'm not i'm neither you know I, i'd be i'm tickled pink to shoot a trophy and i'm gonna try my best to get something big but my end game is really the experience um and um, I just, I really, uh, I enjoy everything about the hunting experience. Like, so for instance, California, I just, four years in a row, I got my ass kicked and I didn't get, I didn't get one, but the experience has been awesome. I've had a lot of stories to tell about it and, I'm, and I feel like it's maybe a better hunter all in all. And I always take something away from it. Uh, would I have liked to take away a set of horns? Yeah. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, right now I want, I want that more than anything. I want to shoot a freaking velvet blacktail in a zone California more than anything right now, because it's, it's eluded me. It's just one of, yeah. those, one of those bucket list things I need to check off. And it's kind of, it's starting to get underneath my skin. It's become a, uh, like a, a curse, so to speak for me. Anyway. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's, it's and that goes along with anything you know it's funny how each person will kind of have that animal that's like the cursed animal to you mm -hmm. and for me it's elk i yeah. mean i i've shot uh two or three bulls with a bow two maybe three two well, i shot three the one no kidding like 44 yards I watched my arrow go completely through the elk. Uh -huh. He got a, he ran about 90 yards, laid down. I watched him lay his antlers on the ground and he was going, <laughs> I was like, he's dead. Went over there, picked up my arrow, looked at my arrow. There was nothing on it. It was like wiped clean. Like it just hit that fat pocket. Oh, it is. And I looked over and he stood up watching me walked away later on that year i found one of the or the next year i found one of his antlers shed hunting <laughs> <laughs> and i mean that sucks oh man yeah like elk have just kicked me in the nuts 
I want to excuse my French. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about it on my podcast. Is ex- I curse like a sailor. I do too. I tell people <laughs> seriously when I get them on the podcast, I'm like, look, I have to really tone it down. When I get on a podcast, I say, I like, I try not to say goddamn, and I try not to say fuck. And other than that, you're good to say whatever you want. And if those come out, I'm not going to get mad at you. <laughs> like, right. I, I'm bad. <laughs> yeah. But. I had one I snuck in and I ranged a cow that I thought – and I thought the cow – the bull walked up to the same spot the cow was. He ended up – he was like 15 yards closer, shot way over him. Mm-hmm. Next year, I army crawled on my belly for 150 yards through grass literally 10 inches tall, mm-hmm. and I missed an elk at 64 yards. Mm-hmm. The very next day, I snuck into 25 yards of that elk. He jumped up, and I missed him at 70 yards. The next – that evening, I had him at six yards in the trees, and I mean, the year after that, I missed an elk. This is last year. I missed an elk again. <laughs> like, yeah. elk is just kicking me in the nuts, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, as that happens, it gets in your it gets in your head. Bad. You know, and and um, you start the, instead of going through the motions in your head, like what you should be talking yourself about when you're go, getting to that you know, get into the kill zone, you start thinking instead of, Hey, I need to do this. Am I feeling my string? Where is my anchor point? Right. You don't think about those things. You don't talk yourself through those things. Instead, you're like, Oh, I hope I don't fuck this up. I hope I don't mess this up. You know, yep, yep. And that's what screws you up because it's, it's not in your normal process. I do this. You want, you want to drill? Sure. Okay, get yourself. I mean, well, maybe not an elk 3D target because those things are like fifteen hundred bucks. <laughs> you know, they are so expensive. <laughs> I, ideally, if you could, that'd be great. But even an elk, one of those silhouette, you know, or uh, oh, you know, who makes those? Uh, they're just targets, you know, like a paper target with an elk on it. And then do drills where you set your bow down. You sprint 50 yards, sprint 50 yards to your bow, shoot as fast as you can, just like fast. Mm-hmm. Now, people say that's going to give you target panic or whatever, but what you're experiencing when you're hunting, your shot is almost always target panic when you're like, I mean, it's hurry up and go. Yep. If you t- if you take out the thinking process of, of how you're shooting and the way, I mean, I'm sure I'm going to get shit on for telling you this, but this is what I've done. And <laughs> don't I, told feel you, bad. I told you in I my get, success rate. I get shit on a lot for stuff I say, so don't feel bad. You know, everybody thinks they know better, but I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to step on my, my soapbox for a second. I've killed over 150 animals with my bow, and this is what I do, and I got a very yeah. high success rate. Yep. So I basically force myself into a panic situation. I I start. As a matter of fact, I got a video on YouTube that you can watch. Um, it. I start at the target. I run to my bow 50 to 60 yards away, pick my bow up, turn around, shoot, run back to the target, touch the target, run back to my bow. And I just keep repeating that till I empty my quiver. And once you start getting your, your groups back to where they're supposed to be, you know, you know that your body has, you've been, you've trained yourself to acquire the target fast and, and, and it's not as much thinking about how you're shooting as you like, cause when you target shoot, everything's a process. You want to think about it. You want to make sure you, but when hunting, it should be like, it's got to be instinctual, you know, it's got to come, yeah. you know, and I, I developed this because I shoot coyotes with a bow and it's mm-hmm. like a drive by shooting. They come running in and you got a, a second to acquire a target, a second to get the shot off and you know, Oh, he just ran in. He's 35 yards. He's 40 yards, you know, just ranging, ranging quickly as you're drawing back in your head, you know, not looking at him saying, Hmm, I think he's about whatever, you know, you don't have that. Everything's just going to come boom, 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 boom. And yeah, you do that. And and then you start putting yourself into 
odd positions. The other thing I do is I start putting myself into odd. Think about all the ways that you can get a shot off at an elk. It's going to be sitting on your butt, on your knees, coming around from behind a tree, drawn back behind a bush, standing up, all those things. Practice all the lifelike scenarios that you can mm-hmm. possibly think of. And when you're proficient at doing that, that that thing that you explained to me that happened last year with the – that ain't going to happen to you no more. Yeah. Yeah. And, Absolutely. Uh, so – yeah. Well, man, that's all I got for you. And I don't know if you got anything for me, but um, I'm sure we could sit here and talk for another two hours and bullshit about hunting and <laughs> what's coming up. But I, I just going to say, talk just for a second about um, my, my approach to hunting out of state. Cause obviously I haven't doing it, been doing it near as long. Um, mm-hmm. I went over the threshold of hunting out of state last year, Uh although I hunt all over the state of Wyoming. You know, you heard how many tags I have just in the state of Wyoming, seven or eight different tags. So what I do is one of the first things that I do is I look and see what what time of year I can hunt in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And then I start looking at states that offer anything and everything that's outside of that time of year. Right. You know, so this Colorado elk tag, for instance, it opens up a week before Wyoming elk or deer for with a bow starts. Cool. I can buy it over the counter. I can hunt the same year every year, you know, same spot every year. Now, then I start looking at like Nebraska. So I can buy a tag in Nebraska that season starts September 1st and it closes December 31st. And I can hunt the entire state of Nebraska with a bow for mule deer and whitetail. So I know right then and there, whether I have a spare time in October, November, or December, I can go hunt, right? Right. Same thing with Idaho. Idaho Mm -hmm. offers the same thing, an extended season like that, where I can't hunt anything in Wyoming anyways. So I might as well go hunt an area that I can buy a tag every year and go hunting. Right. And then Arizona, that's where Arizona comes in. I can't hunt any of those states I've mentioned in January. Arizona, Mm -hmm. I can. You know, so that's, that's what I look for. Um, because as of right now, until I shoot 10 bucks that are all 180 inch plus, I'm not looking for it. I mean, yeah, if I see a 200 inch monster, you can guarantee I'm going to go try and kill that deer. But when I go, or even elk, when I go to an area, I'm not looking for a 400 inch bull or expecting, let's put it that way. I mean, I'm looking cool. Yeah. I hope I find one, but I'm not expecting to kill a 400 inch bull or to kill a 200 inch deer. I'm expecting to go there and see deer that excite me that I want to make a play on. Yep. That's what I shoot for. And I know that if I can find places that I can do that every single year, my consistency and my success is going to go way up and as well as my knowledge. And then I can start building points in other areas. And by the time I draw one of those tags, my knowledge and my experience and all the times of having a deer at full draw at 30 yards or whatever else, that's going to compound, and I, then I can put all that towards a tag where I can expect to shoot a 200-plus-inch deer. That's yeah. kind of what I do. That you, you know what you do? I do I do the same thing. You just said it a lot better than me. I got I got a little caught up on 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 how I lay it out, but you basically do the exact same thing. Like I I look for all the places that I can hunt long time. So like for instance, Alabama, you can hunt in February. I went last year. Oh, oh heck yeah. See, that's wicked cool. Yeah. Just kind of extend anything you could do to extend your season. I, I love those ones that are like California. Okay. It's in J- July. I love those ones that start before anybody else. And I love those ones that go on way past them. Cause it's like, it's just super easy. Exactly. And in, in Hawaii, that was a cool one that you threw in there. Hawaii is one that you can literally go any time of the year, much like Texas. Yeah. Um, and if you figure Hawaii out, it's a hundred dollars for the hunting license and you can literally get a round trip airplane ticket for around $700. So that's an $800 hunting trip. You can put that in the budget every year and go there every year in April or every year yeah. in May. What the heck else are you going to be hunting? Yeah. yeah. You know, maybe spring bear, I guess yeah. you could be hunting spring bear in May, but June, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I, the funny thing is, I had a little talk with them too. I'm like, "Hey, listen, Daddy's gonna go on a podcast today." I know you're not used to being quiet. 
but keep your mouths down. <laughs> <laughs> They're yelling at each other. Oh man. So anyhow, well, cool. Um, I'm glad we had a chance uh, to do this. And uh, yeah, I think it's good, man. I'm yeah, glad I hope, to see, I hope I'm your glad listeners to see you doing well. Thank you, thank you, and I hope your listeners find value in whatever I just blabbed about. Yeah, they will. <laughs> they will for sure. No, cool, because cool. there's a lot of you know a lot of people ask about that stuff. 